Welcome to A Good Night for a Murder, a Victorian true crime podcast. My name is Kim, and by the time you're done listening to this episode, my hope is that you too will have the same one lingering question circling around in your brain about this case as I have for weeks. And that question is, why was no one covered in blood? Because when they make up a rhyme that goes, Lizzie Borden took an axe and gave her mother 40 wax. When she saw what she had done, she gave her father 41. Well, someone ought to be caught red-handed for that crime, right? But no one ever was. This is the case of Lizzie Borden. But first, the Victorian Society tip. Borden's final meal in their home is often discussed because so much of the morning's events center around who was downstairs in the kitchen having breakfast when. In fact, the Borden home still stands today and is now a bed and breakfast where you can enjoy a version of the family's final meal during your stay. The Borden family's last meal in the home included a breakfast of cold boiled mutton, warmed over mutton broth, bread and butter, johnny cakes, which are pancakes made with cornmeal, Sugar cookies, bananas, pears, and coffee. If this sounds a little unusual to you, I have some advice from the cookery chapters of the 1880 edition of Castle's Household Guide that may help explain. Everybody knows that a good cook is an economical cook. The great secret in cooking is to make food palatable and to not waste the nutriment contained in the meat and neither to let it boil or steam out. If you boil your dinner, always keep the liquor in which it has boiled. There must be the very essence of the meat in it, and it is therefore always good to cook for vegetable soup. Always cover your pot and let the steam which contains the strength fall back into the stew. Never waste anything. Remember the old adage, waste not, want not. Save every bone, every leaf, every crust, and make them into soup. Lizzie Borden was born in 1860 in Fall River, Massachusetts. Her parents were Sarah and Andrew Borden. The couple also had an older daughter, Emma, who was nine years older than Lizzie. Lizzie and Emma's mother, Sarah, died in March of 1863, reportedly of uterine congestion and spinal disease, when Lizzie was only three years old and Emma was 12. It's said that some of Sarah's parting words to her eldest daughter, Emma, was a request of her to take care of baby Lizzie. Three years later, when the girls are now 6 and 15, their father gets married again to Abby Durfee Gray. Now, this was widely regarded as a marriage of convenience for both Andrew and Abby. Andrew had multiple businesses to run, a household to keep, two young girls to look after, and he'd been married once already. And Abby, at 37 years of age, was already considered a spinster at that point. So the two of them go ahead and get married. So this was arguably more difficult for Emma being a teenager than it was for Lizzie. Though, if she harbored any resentment, she didn't really show it. And even though Lizzie was only three when her mother died and doesn't have any memories of her, Abby was never particularly maternal with either of her girls. As they get older, neither girl calls Abby mother, they call her Mrs. Borden. So while the relationship was not overly warm or paternal, it was described with words like cordial and not exactly pleasant, but not unpleasant. It sounds like they were more transactional in their day-to-day interactions rather than anything. So, a little bit more background on the Borden family. They lived in Fall River, Massachusetts, which is about an hour or so south of Boston and only about 30 minutes or so north of Newport, Rhode Island. At the time, Fall River was described as a bustling city of about 83,000 people with lively textile and manufacturing mill businesses powered by the Quickishan River that ran through its center. And the Borden family was one of seven established prominent families in the region that pretty much owned Fall River. That's not to say that all the lines of the Borden family were wealthy, though. Lizzie's father, Andrew Borden, actually grew up very modestly and struggled financially as a young man, but eventually earned his wealth as a furniture and casket manufacturer and seller, property developer, owner of several textile mills and commercial properties, and was also president of the Union Savings Bank. At the time of his death, his estate was valued at what in today's money would be a cool $9.5 million. Despite this, he was known for being very frugal. They never upgraded their home to add indoor plumbing, though indoor plumbing was common to have in affluent homes at the time. And he, in fact, refused to upgrade their home entirely by refusing to move to a wealthier section of town known as The Hill, 
even though pretty much all other wealthy families, including its own relatives, lived there. So his daughters weren't like spoiled brats about this, but it did seem to be a bit of a rub for them. You know, they too wanted to be counted amongst the ranks of the fine ladies who lived on the hill. But at the end of the day, they kind of accepted their father for who he was and the life that he wanted near town. Another rub that caused tension between the sisters and their father and stepmother happened in 1887 when some family members of Abbey's who lived in town could no longer to afford the duplex they had been living in. One family member wanted to move out and the other wanted to stay but couldn't afford it on their own, so they were going to have to sell the whole thing. This upset Abby that a home that had been in her family was going to have to be sold and her family members would have to uproot themselves. So Andrew purchased the entire duplex and gifted it to his wife, Abby, so that her family could stay. And if you're thinking, well, that sounds reasonable. What's wrong with that? Many people would agree with you. But something about this incensed Lizzie and Emma. Maybe because they viewed it as their father helping outsiders, Maybe they thought Abby had manipulated their father. I feel like there must be more to the story we don't know, like this was just one more thing on the pile. But whatever the case, Lizzie and Emma are pissed, and this causes a rift in what was already kind of a chilly, tenuous relationship. Andrew does try to make amends by gifting his daughters their grandfather's former house that he owned, which they essentially go on to act as landlords of and collect rent on. And they're happy enough to take it, but it does little to mend the relationship in the Borden household. In fact, by this time, the girls rarely even take meals with Andrew and Abby anymore. The meal is prepared and they're served in shifts sitting in the dining room, Andrew and Abby, then Lizzie and Emma separately. There's one other peculiar thing I need to tell you about life in the Borden residence. Sometime in 1890, there was a break-in at the Borden home. Andrew reported the break-in himself, reporting that a thief had broken in in broad daylight while his daughters and maid were home, and snuck up the back steps into the master bedroom, where cash and gold jewelry were stolen from his desk and Mrs. Borden's jewelry box. Also missing were a number of horse car tickets, like tickets for public transportation around the city. After this, the entire family got very serious about keeping their doors, desks, and dressers locked. Like, all of the time. No one would even step out to the yard or barn in the back of the house without locking the door behind them. And even though the entire house was kept locked up, they also locked their own bedroom doors when they weren't in them. Andrew, however, locked his room and would leave the key on the mantel in the living room. Some say this was to send a message to his girls, or Lizzie in particular, to say that he knew it was her who had robbed his bedroom and office, and he was going to place the key in plain sight, because if it was someone from the outside, he should have nothing to worry about, right? Also, the horse car tickets were a special perk Andrew had for having one time worked for the railway, and the conductors were notified to alert of anyone unusual using them, and it was rumored that Lizzie was seen using them. But, like I said, rumors. Later that year, the family's barn behind the house was also broken into twice. But none of these robberies were ever solved. All this to point out the weird trust issues that seemed to be happening in the house, plus the fact that the family could be being targeted by an intruder. So we've arrived in August 1892 now. Lizzie and Emma are both young women now, never married. Andrew is busy with his work. Abby is busy being his wife. And the family employs one live-in maid named Bridget Sullivan. Bridget was an Irish immigrant who the family called Maggie, not because it was her name, but because it was the name of the last maid they employed before her. And I guess they figured, why change? rich people. So interesting to note, Bridget tried to resign from working with the Bordens on three separate occasions, but she was always persuaded to stay by Mrs. Borden, at first out of loyalty and later by a pay increase. On the evening of August 2nd, 1892, Emma is away visiting friends. The Borden family has leftover swordfish for dinner. That night, everyone is sick with upset stomachs. Andrew and Abby get the worst of it. It's the leftover seafood they ate, right? But is it? Early the next morning, Abby runs across the street to the home of their neighbor and local doctor, Dr. Bowen, and is very upset that the whole family, especially Mr. Borden, have been very sick all night, and can he come attend to them? She goes as far to say she's afraid their milk has been poisoned. But when Dr. Bowen tries to head over there, Andrew comes to the door and starts shouting and hollering to him not to come. So I guess he can't be that bad, right? Dr. Bowen heads back home. That evening, just before dinner, 
John Morris arrives unannounced at the boarding house. John is Andrew's brother-in-law and Lizzie and Emma's uncle. Apparently, he stayed with the family from time to time, and this time he was there to talk to Andrew about some business dealings and handle some other business he had in town. Even though he's unannounced, Andrew did actually write inviting him there a week prior, and Abby and Andrew welcomed him in and set him up in the guest bedroom upstairs. Also sometime that evening, Lizzie visits with her friend in town, Alice Russell, for two hours or so, telling her how sick everyone was the night before and how she's been feeling kind of afraid, frankly. And she kind of unloads onto Alice about all of these unsettling events that have been going on, starting with the daylight break-ins, a dispute she overheard her father get in with one of his renters, a shadowy figure she saw lurking about the property one night, and of course this poisoning they can't quite seem to identify the source of. Lizzie seems afraid that her father has made the family a target through his business dealings. While it was never said that Andrew was unfair or stealing from anyone, he didn't get rich off his own money, obviously. He had people he had to collect from, he had property dealings he went out in, and in those dealings, somebody had to lose some time. And I get the impression that he could be quite unapologetic or callous about it. So it's the morning of August 4, 1892. Everyone is still feeling the effects of this food poisoning incident or what have you. Andrew leaves the house to go to work. So does Uncle John Morse. Remember that Emma is out of town. Abby is going about her day, having her breakfast and what have you. She asks Bridget to get to work washing the inside and outside of the windows that morning. Then Abby starts tackling her to-do list for the day, which includes chores around the house and errands in town, like going to visit a friend of hers she heard was sick and changing the bedding in Uncle John Morse's room, just going here, going there, going everywhere. Lizzie, who tries not to be downstairs the same time as Abby, comes down to have her coffee and breakfast. Bridget is around doing chores, getting ready to wash the windows. Andrew comes home from work, and he's going to have a little cat nap on the sofa in the parlor. Bridget finishes washing all the windows from the outside of the house and heads up to her room to take a little break. She's still not feeling 100% from the food poisoning incident either. Lizzie goes out to the barn at the back of the property for something. We'll come back to that. She picks some pears from their tree to snack on, mills around the barn. She's out there for 20 minutes or so. Then she heads back to the house where she finds her father, Andrew, laying on the couch with his head and face so beaten and bloody, she can't even recognize him. The entire parlor is a bloodbath. Blood is soaking the carpet. It's splattered across the walls. Lizzie runs to the stairs and screams for Bridget. Bridget comes tearing down the stairs, sees Lizzie backed up against the door where Lizzie tells her to run and get a doctor. She thinks father is hurt. Bridget starts to head through the parlor, but Lizzie stops her, begs her don't go in, just run and get a doctor. So Bridget heads out the other door, runs across the road to Dr. Bowen's house. The doctor's wife says he's not there, he's out visiting patients, and she'll send him as soon as she can. Bridget runs back home where Lizzie is right where she left her. She tries to ask Lizzie what happened. Lizzie says she was out back and she heard a groan from inside. Then asks Bridget to run and fetch Alice Russell for her, the good friend she confided in the night before. Bridget tears off again to fetch Mrs. Russell. After a short while, the Borden's neighbor, Miss Adelaide Church, comes to the door. She saw Bridget running about the neighborhood and thought she'd better come over right away and see what was the matter. Lizzie tells Mrs. Churchill someone has killed her father. Mrs. Churchill asks where her mother is, meaning Abby. Lizzie says she'd gone out. I don't know where. I was in the barn. We've all been sick. I don't know where the doctor is. Mrs. Churchill offers to go try and find a doctor, so she leaves. Bridget finds Alice Russell at home and tells her to come at once and rushes back to the boarding house. Dr. Bowen is just arriving at the front of the house, and Mrs. Churchill has also returned and is inside with Lizzie. Bridget joins them, and then Alice Russell arrives and joins a woman in the kitchen while Dr. Bowen has gone into the parlor. Dr. Bowen is shocked to find Andrew Borden sliding sideways off the couch with his face essentially cut in two. He looks around the room and eerily notices that not a single thing in the room is out of place. He feels for a pulse on Andrew, and while the body is still warm, Andrew Borden is certainly dead. About that time, a police officer and another neighbor from a few doors down turn up at the door. I'm not sure if someone called the police or word was just spreading through the neighborhood, but here they are. 
The officer deputizes the neighbor right there on the steps and tells him don't let anyone in besides the police. Then Dr. Bowen shows the officer Andrew's body in the parlor and the officer leaves to bring back reinforcements. Most of the Fall River Police Department, you see, happened to be at an annual policeman's picnic in Rhode Island that day with their families. Meanwhile, in the kitchen, Bridget, Alice Russell, and Mrs. Churchill are doing their best to look after Lizzie, who is frantic, crying, confused. She seems to kind of waffle in and out of coherent thought, asking for someone to send for her sister, and then asking, can someone please find Mrs. Borden? Lizzie had previously told Bridget that Abby had received a note to call on a sick friend that morning, so Bridget says, oh, I wish I could, but I don't know where she's gone. And that's when Lizzie says, no, I think I heard her come in. What? When? If Abby came home within the 20 minutes Lizzie was out back in the barn, how would you hear that? Wouldn't she also have come running the second she heard Lizzie yelling? Did Lizzie actually let her come in and go right upstairs in the short time Lizzie was waiting by the back door with her father's body in the parlor? This is weird. So someone is going to have to look around the house for Abby Borden. But what if the murderer is still in the house? Bridget and Mrs. Churchill steal themselves and set off to search the house. There is a point on the staircase headed upstairs where your eyes will be about level with the second floor. Now, the staircase continues forward and makes a curve, so one's instinct is to continue to look in front of you. But if you direct your gaze to the side, you can see across the upstairs landing and into the guest bedroom. And while standing on that specific step, you can see under the guest bedroom bed where the woman's spot can only be Abby Borden lying on the floor on the far side of the bed. Bridget rushes up the steps while Mrs. Churchill runs back down to alert the others. Upstairs, Bridget finds the body of Abby Borden laying face down on the carpet between the bed and the dresser with a pool of drying blood surrounding her. In the end, it was determined that Abby Borden, at the age of 65, was struck down by roughly 17 blows while her husband, Andrew, age 70, was struck 10 times. Now, we can look at the investigation and trial two ways. One is through the 19th century lens. And the second is through the 21st century year 2022 lens. Ultimately, it was Lizzie Borden who was tried for the crime, though the evidence was largely circumstantial. And I don't think I'm giving away any spoilers here when I tell you that Lizzie was in fact acquitted. The case of Lizzie Borden went on to become one of the most sensational and famous murder cases to this day. I am not going to go into detail of the investigation and trial in this episode. We will be here for weeks, if not months. If you're interested in that, though, I've linked to some good book recommendations in the episode notes. What I will summarize for you now is how they arrived at the not guilty verdict in 1893 versus how things might have been different if she were tried to die. And we'll also talk about some other suspects. Lizzie Borden stood accused of murdering her father and stepmother with a hatchet. Her motive, they said, was money. She'd grown frustrated with her father's miserly ways and offed both her stepmother and father to get at her inheritance quicker. Now, the same way we can look at the trial through the 19th versus 21st century lenses, we can drill down further into the 19th century and look at the trial through the legal lens, but also through the lens of public opinion and the media. From a legal perspective, you have to ask, did the prosecution successfully prove their case? And to be honest, no, I don't think they did that. They had no real evidence. First, the police had found a hatchet blade in the basement and a box of other tools where the handle had recently been broken off. It was covered in a dirt or a grit that was different from the other tools in the box, and the prosecution alleged it was covered in ash that had been used to try and clean blood off of it. A key witness, Edward Wood, who was a professor and chemist at Harvard, had thoroughly examined and tested both the hatchet head and the handle that they claimed to have found separately and found absolutely zero traces of blood. Also, they didn't examine any of the other tools in the box to confirm the dirt on them was actually different than that of the hatchet. They just had some officers' eyewitness accounts being like, no, it was not the same. So that's an open end for me. Second, Lizzie changed her dress after the murders just as the police were arriving to investigate. Further, the next day, she burned one of her dresses in front of Alice Russell and her sister Emma, saying it was old and covered in paint and she was sick of looking at it. Obviously, the prosecution is alleging that Lizzie was trying to dispose of the bloodstained dress she wore when she murdered her parents. But Bridget, Alice Russell, Mrs. Churchill, and Dr. Bowen 
also Lizzie before she changed, and I don't think all of them would have failed to notice her covered in blood. Further, no one could seem to remember what dress Lizzie had been wearing either before or after at all. Wasn't it peculiar that she changed in the first place, though? Not really. None of the women thought it strange that she threw on something more proper once police officers started to swarm all over her house. In fact, when Bridget ran to fetch Alice Russell that morning, the first thing Alice did was throw on a fresh dress. Not that unusual at all. They went down the rabbit hole on this dress, and none of it really ever added up to a damn thing. Another point that comes up is the night after the murder, there were police stationed around the house, and one of them saw Lizzie and Alice Russell come into the basement together to empty a slop pail. A short while later, Lizzie returned by herself and was seen bending over the sink. I'm not quite sure what they're alleging she was doing here or how this conveys guilt. Were they trying to say she was attempting to dispose of more evidence? Either way, this testimony doesn't really prove anything. In fact, one very reasonable explanation for it is that Lizzie had her period that week and had menstrual cloths soaking in the basement. The all-male prosecution, defense, law, and judicial officials were not going to touch anything having to do with menstruation with a 50-foot pole. What's more, the simple fact that Lizzie was a woman and one of the upper middle class who regularly attended church at that she couldn't possibly have done something as horrific as this. The fact that the killer likely stood astride Abby as they struck her was used as hard evidence that it could not have been Lizzie, because a proper lady could simply not stand with her legs straddling a person as such. And we may roll our eyes at this, but in 1893, that was fact. Women and our women brains were physically not capable or wired the same way as men's. Women couldn't do hard labor or have the emotions that would allow us to carry out such a brutal murder. It just wasn't possible. So when you think about how these 12 white upper middle class male jurors could have found her not guilty, yeah, I'd say based on what they were presented with, they did their job. They couldn't convict her based on the prosecution's case. Now, the court of public opinion and media coverage was a different story. There were all sorts of tidbits and rumors leaked to the press that largely influenced public opinion that were not brought into the courtroom. One major strike against Lizzie would have been her inquest transcript. If it had been allowed, this would have been one of the most damning pieces of evidence against her. Throughout the inquest, she was evasive, curt, confusing, she contradicted herself, and she couldn't for her life be fried any sort of linear timeline for that morning. In one contradiction, for example, she said she went to the barn for a bit of screen to mend a window. Then she was randomly looking for sinkers for her fishing lines. It was very convoluted and frankly maddening to read. Separately, there was an incident where Lizzie was overheard yelling at her sister who was visiting her in jail, something about how Emma had given her away. Also, her clothing choices and demeanor were scrutinized to no end. First, she didn't dress in traditional morning wear. As such, she was clearly not in mourning, meaning she was not sorry, meaning she definitely did it. She was largely uncooperative or combative with the police. She didn't cry enough. She was too put together, too stoic, too cold. But if you knew her, that was always her demeanor. Words like serene or poised could easily be substituted. Finally, one day, she faints in court after the prosecution revealed as part of the autopsy they had decapitated her parents and boiled all the flesh off of their skulls, which they then unveiled right there in the courtroom. And people were like, aha, she's human after all. This all goes without saying that the entire trial was a media circus. They converted the courthouse's horse shed into a headquarters for telegraph operators reporting the trial news. 25 court reporters were jammed into the press box, and every day, spectators lined up for a glimpse of Lizzie's arrival, and it was constantly remarked upon about how the majority of the crowd was women. So, for every point where the prosecution failed to legally prove Lizzie's guilt, the court of public opinion could provide a counterpoint convicting her, or, likewise, for her innocence for that matter. But no matter what people thought, at the end of the day, our legal system officially pronounced her not guilty. After the trial, Lizzie and Emma move into a mansion on the hill in Fall River, like they always wanted to. But things were not happily ever after from there. Lizzie was ostracized by the community, and she and Emma led fairly isolated lives for a time. When Lizzie started keeping questionable company and throwing parties for people like socialites and actresses, 
Emma disagreed with her lifestyle so much that she left. She moved out and never saw her sister again. I have to think there was something more to it than she just didn't like her sister's friends. In kind of a twist of fate, though, the sisters died only nine days apart in June 1927, Lizzie of pneumonia at the age of 67, and Emma from kidney problems at the age of 76. Both are buried side by side in their family plot in Oak Grove Cemetery in Fall River. So that wraps up how we can look at it from the 19th century perspective. Now, let's take it from the top, viewing this case through our 21st century lens, using everything we know based upon what was presented at trial and all other analysis of the case since then. First, could a woman even commit this crime? Yes, of course they could. But let's look at the method of murder for a moment. 17 ax strikes for Abby and 10 for Andrew. Both of their skulls were pulp, essentially. The injuries were way beyond what would be necessary to kill them. This is what profilers call overkill, and in cases of overkill, the motive is usually personal, with anger as the main driver. Go ahead and go punch your pillow 10 times. Go ahead, press pause. It's a lot, right? If this was a botched robbery, for example, I don't think we would see the overkill we saw in the boarding case. Same for if it was a contract killing. I mean, they get in, do their job, and get out. So this crime for sure could be perpetrated by a woman. We see overkill, which means the killer knew the victims personally. Does Lizzie have a motive? If the goal was to get her inheritance, then yes. But if that were the case, only Andrew would have had to die. His will left everything to his surviving heirs, Lizzie and Emma, anyway. Some would think he left everything to his wife, and that's why they both had to die, but that's not true. Further, what little their stepmother had in her estate became property of her husband, which in turn went to the girls, but after the trial, Lizzie and Emma signed all of it over to Abby's sisters, including the deed to the duplex house Andrew had gifted his wife for only $1. Now, Lizzie and Emma did take that inheritance and move into a larger, more modern house, so there's that, but that was an inheritance. They could do what they wanted with it. Also, a lot of people think it's peculiar that they chose to stay in Fall River, where they were ridiculed and shunned by the community. But to that matter, Lizzie responded, when the truth comes out about this murder, I want to be living here so I can walk down and meet those of my old friends who have been cutting me for all these years. So that's another mark in the innocent column, maybe? As far as other suspects, the maid Bridget Sullivan was the only other one in the house at the time, conveniently napping upstairs in the middle of the day. Sounds a little sus, but... The only motive they could come up for her was far-fetched, if you ask me. It was said that she and Lizzie were having a secret illicit love affair and had been found out by Andrew and Abby. So they, they what? They killed them so they could be together? They'd have to kill everybody. It was 1892. There was no safe place for two women to live together romantically. Another motive was that she just flew into a rage over being asked to wash the windows while she was still sick. And to be honest, Now that I say it out loud, that one almost kind of tracks, but Bridget was the only one who could account for all of her movements that morning, much of which were corroborated by Lizzie, and in the end, she was cleared. There is also Uncle John Morse. A motive for Uncle John is that he was having an affair with his niece, and she was pregnant. Of course, he denies his allegations, as does Lizzie. There is no proof of evidence to suggest Lizzie was ever pregnant. Did he stand to benefit monetarily from the death of his brother-in-law, though? I don't know. I couldn't find any evidence of that, but it doesn't mean there wasn't any. I mean, did they even look or were they too distracted by Lizzie Borden? Who knows? Another theory is that he could have been trying to act as a white knight in shining armor for his late sister's daughters who were held under the iron grip of their father. The police did look closely into John Morris, but he had a very airtight buttoned up alibi for his whereabouts that morning. Though some may call it a little too neat and tidy as if it was manufactured. For example, he remembered the train car number he sat on and even the number on the conductor's cap, and that a group of priests were on board, which they were, but none of them recalled seeing him. Though, they don't recall seeing anyone else in particular, for that matter. But again, he was confirmed to be where he said he was, and he was cleared. Could it have been the other sister, Emma? Did she sneak back from her friend's place over 15 miles away, murder her parents, then sneak back in the middle of the day in time to get the telegram with the terrible news later that morning without anyone noticing? It's unlikely. 
Later modern case analysis alleges that Andrew had an illegitimate son named William who was trying to extort him for money. Although it was later proven that while William Borden did exist, he was certainly not descended from Andrew. Did Andrew have some sour business dealings though? Probably. Was anyone on the receiving end bad enough to want to kill him? To commit overkill? Why Abby too then? Or was she just collateral damage? She did actually get the worst of it though. And here's where I'm going to bring up that question I mentioned at the top of the episode. Why was no one covered in blood? Lizzie had only been outside 20 to 30 minutes before returning and finding her father dead, before immediately sending the alarm. Dr. Bowen got there in time so that Andrew's body was still warm. If Lizzie did it, if Bridget did it, they should have been covered in blood spatter. The parlor was a mess. It had blood up the walls. Whoever killed Abby stood over her, striking straight down to kill her. This is 1892, right? A Victorian woman couldn't quick run and get a shower in 10 minutes and appear how those two did immediately following that crime. There's a rumor that Lizzie committed the crimes naked. I don't buy it. If it was Morse, the man didn't even bring any bags with him. He just had one suit they was wearing last night, that morning when he left, and when he returned after the murders. It would even have been risky for a higher killer or someone else to commit those crimes and walk out on the street. Although unlikely, not impossible. During the trial, they extensively asked a number of witnesses who were in the area that morning who else they noticed around them when they were passing by the Borden house. And nothing anyone said was useful. But are the residents of Fall River so unobservant that they didn't notice a blood-soaked man walking down the road at 11 a.m.? Unsure. So... I am going to render my own official a good night with a murder verdict. Almost. I think, I think she did it, but not without help. I think it feels like there was a lot of built up tension in that house and it was a pressure cooker. And I think the sister was complicit in it. Emma and Lizzie were extremely, extremely close and Emma always felt responsible for Lizzie. So I think it's plausible that once they set their mind to do it, to break free from the hold their father had over them, Emma was aligned but didn't want to be there, so she left town. On the day of, Lizzie took herself for a little walk to the barn, came back to find the deed done. But who actually held the murder weapon? I don't know. Could it have been Morris? Could it have been someone else? I would believe both. But if I found out it was someone who lost out in a business dealing with Andrew, who had lost their livelihood as a result somehow, had their family suffer as a result, I'd believe that too. That would account for the overkill and a way the theory about Lizzie and Emma conspiring to have someone else commit the murder would not. But I would love to know what you think. Was she guilty or innocent? If not Lizzie, then who? Why was no one covered in blood? If you head over to Instagram or TikTok at a good night for a murder, you can let me know there, plus see some photos of the Borden family, the infamous crime scene photos, and more. You can also see the photos and all source links in the episode blog on my website at a goodnightforamurder.com. Plus, you can sign up for the Good Night for a Murder newsletter on the website. Each month, I send an episode roundup, reveal of next month's episodes, and other goodies like book recommendations, extra Victorian society tips, and more. The bonus content for a housekeeper and butler to your patrons for this episode is the story of the other murder in the Borden family history. To subscribe to Patreon and learn more about the podcast, you can visit a goodnightforamurder.com. Also, follow me on Instagram or TikTok at a goodnightforamurder. Please rate and review and share with your friends. Thank you for listening, and I will talk to you again soon.